I've never engaged with a game the way I do with Animal Crossing New Horizons. Most days I spend at least an hour running around my island, digging up fossils, watering flowers, and greeting my villagers and gifting them things. I'll return in the evening to check for shooting stars or see if Celeste or Wisp is wandering around. This routine puts me at ease, and at least for a few minutes out of the day, I get a chance to take a deep breath and remember that I'm capable of feeling like a human. Which is kind of weird, considering I'm talking to a bunch of virtual animals who call me Scooter. <laughs> New Horizons is on track to become the best-selling game for the Switch. I see a lot of its success attributed to the game offering escapism during lockdown, or providing a routine while we're all stuck at home. And yeah, this probably has affected its popularity, but it's unfair to dismiss the game based on global events that Nintendo couldn't have predicted when they started development. New Horizons was always going to be a massive success because the Animal Crossing series has been popular from its very start. Each game in the series differs from the last in big and small ways, but all of them are deeply rooted in communication, compassion, and village life. And you really couldn't ask for a better setting than the village for a game like this. It's small enough to feel intimate, yet large enough to give you a sense of freedom and independence. And despite the ever-present in-game clock, the series is mostly divorced from the present, taking place in an expressly fictional village that has no real time or place. This isn't just a game feature, it's a Japanese concept called Furusado. You're probably already familiar with the way Furusado looks thanks to Japanese media exports. We're running Kenshin, Inuyasha, Mushishi, Okami, even Ocarina of Time. One could argue that Pokémon even builds on Furusado tropes, though some of the most easily recognizable examples would be the animated films of Miyazaki Hayao and Studio Ghibli, with their worlds of lush villages, old shrines, and pastoral landscapes in tension with urban life and modern Japan. Furusado functions as a shorthand for cultural nostalgia connected to village life that no longer exists, often represented as an idyllic, non-existent countryside home, a faraway place in the past. Up until recently, Japan consisted mostly of villages, but after rapid industrialization brought on by Western influence in the late 1800s, these villages began to empty or disappear entirely. Fast forward to the 1980s and 90% of the population is living in cities, and the post-war economic boom Japan had been experiencing had stalled out. Attempting to inspire national pride and confidence and distract from bad economic conditions, the Japanese government dusts off for Asado and reminds everyone of this idealized Japan. They ran ad campaigns that focused on getting city folk to hop on a train and rediscover their home in rural villages. Wait a second. That sounds kind of familiar. The only thing that's missing is a sweatered blue cat asking you questions as you ride to your unknown destination. If you're familiar with Animal Crossing, Furusado is likely recognizable to you. Furusado literally means old village, but its closer English equivalents are home and native place. As a landscape, the quintessential features of Furusado include forested mountains, fields cut by a meandering river, and a cluster of thatch-roofed farmhouses. For anyone that isn't familiar, Animal Crossing is what's referred to as a social simulator. Each of the main title games begin with the player character arriving in their new home, a village populated by anthropomorphic animals. In-game activities include fishing, catching bugs, and socializing with the villagers. The in-game clock simulates real time, which affects which fish and bugs you can catch, if shops are open or closed, and even what color the landscape is as seasons change. The only real objective the game gives you is to pay off your interest-free mortgage, however, like most things in the game, this is completely optional. While the games all have a definitive beginning, there is no middle or end. They are entirely player-driven, and you have no goals except for the ones that you set for yourself. They're all about freedom and what you decide to do with it. The first game in the series, Dobotsu no Mori, or Animal Forest, released in 2001. It was a Japanese exclusive and Nintendo's last first-party release for the N64. It was initially planned for the 64DD, which was a peripheral for the N64, but the DD failed at market, originally intended to be a much larger game with a bigger scope that featured a more goal-oriented player experience. Without the extra processing power of the DD, it had to be slimmed down considerably to run on the N64. Instead of the player needing the help of animal villagers to dungeon crawl, beat bosses, and complete a storyline, it became the Animal Crossing experience we know today, an open-ended life sim with no real goals that relied on small yet meaningful tasks to provide player satisfaction. Dobatsu no Mori was never intended to be released outside of Japan. Hallmarks of Japanese villages were prominently featured. 
small mail offices, Shinto-inspired shrines, morning group calisthenics, even starting the game with a train ride out to the countryside which mirrored the Furusato ad campaigns run by the government. But Nintendo of America pushed to do a localization, and the translated version became Animal Crossing Population Growing, which released in September 2002. For the localization, the village was reworked to be less Japanese. Bell shrines became wishing wells, tofu was replaced with chowder, Japanese festivals were swapped out for international ones, and if anything was too Japanese to convert, it was dropped altogether. And even after removing its explicitly Japanese elements, the game still is deeply rooted in Furuzato. To understand why, we have to go back to the very start. The story of Animal Crossing begins in 1986, when a young game dev named Aguchi Katsuya moved from his home in Chiba to Kyoto to start working for Nintendo. After cutting his teeth on some of Nintendo's major releases for the N64 in the 90s, he was given the freedom to direct his own original title. He used this opportunity to make a game about community and connection. Inspired by the intense loneliness he had experienced after moving away from his home and leaving his family and friends behind, Aguchi certainly wasn't alone in these feelings. Throughout Japan, people had been feeling a loss of community. As mentioned earlier, Japan's post-war economic boom stalled out in the 80s. And then things got worse. The economy collapsed in 1991 and remained stagnant, turning the 90s into what's referred to as the lost decade. Many argue that, since the economy never recovered, this lost decade never really ended. It kept going into the 2000s, as the Animal Crossing series really started to take off. And now that the Japanese people were overwhelmingly living in cities and going through this recession separated from friends and family and home, it makes sense they'd be looking for support and connection. Furusato is much more than aesthetic, and this longing for community is central to it. In 1984, the Asahi Shinbun, a leading national paper, asked readers to write in with what Furusato meant to them. One of the people who wrote in, a woman and homemaker, described Furusato as, When and if a kernel of confidence, trust, and dependency grows between you and your new neighbors, then new Furusato is born. Or as a civil servant put it, Furusato should be a place where one can return whenever the urge strikes, and ideally is a place where one's kokoro finds repose, and where daily life routines are grounded in compassion. The basis for Animal Crossing is just that, daily life routines grounded in compassion, little worlds that you can return to at any time for as long as you like. Aguchi had created virtual Furusato. Since Jobotsu no Mori, each game in the Animal Crossing series has continued to evolve and expand the relationship between the player and their village community. Wild World was released for the DS in 2005 or 2006, depending on where you are in the world, and the game was even more popular than the previous titles. It firmly established the mechanics of Animal Crossing, while also cementing its global popularity. Wild World was popular in ways population growing never had a chance to be, and began to demonstrate how appealing Furusato could be around the globe. It was followed by Animal Crossing City Folk in 2008, which was released for the Nintendo Wii and is an outlier in the series. Its reviews left something to be desired, with a common criticism being that the game felt lazy and that it looked like Wild World but widescreen. And then there's the city aspect. Instead of spending their time entirely focused on the village, players traveled to and from the city to shop, quietly pivoting away from the quaint village life where you built solidarity with your neighbors to a simulation of living in a suburb. Which I'm sure might be novel for some, but speaking from experience, it's not the most inspiring premise. The game ends up being at odds with itself, distracting players with the bright lights of the city instead of sticking to building community, which is the core of every other Animal Crossing game. So despite being aesthetically charming and fun for newcomers, the game is the least popular in the series and the worst received of the main title games. 2012 saw the release of New Leaf for the 3DS. The most notable change for this game was that the player was made mayor and had a greater sense of responsibility for the community through public works projects and ordinances. Additionally, the city features from City Folk were entirely reworked, so that instead of traveling away from your village, as it expands, the conveniences that were in the city become integrated into the town instead. New Horizons is the latest entry into the series, having come out in March 2020. The game has already proven to be wildly popular and provides a familiar yet distinct Animal Crossing experience. Notably departing from the previous titles by relocating to a deserted island where the player builds the village from the ground up, 
Similar to how New Leaf made the player mayor, New Horizons making the player the resident rep allows for a deeper connection to the village. With this new responsibility, the player is entrusted with bringing their new community together, and by starting from scratch, there is an opportunity to shape the village in ways previous games never allowed. New Horizons also gives the player the most control they've ever had in the series. Terraforming, outdoor decorating, and easily customizable physical appearance are just a few ways in which the player can directly change things. And these features exist to help you set the stage for your community to happen. For all the control these features give over the island, ultimately it's to provide a space for players and villagers to freely live out their lives. Even the modest story that the game provides as you progress through the earliest stages focuses on this idea of providing an excellent home for the island's new residents and visitors. This new approach has led journalists to call New Horizons a quiet revolution, and a game that asks players what makes a society. And while Animal Crossing probably isn't the first series you'd think of when talking about politics and gaming, these statements are politically charged. Aguchi wanted to make a game to fill in for the lack of community he was experiencing in modern-day urbanized Japan, which ended up striking a chord not only with other Japanese people, but with people all around the world. Politics is the process of shaping our society and how we live, and in that way, Animal Crossing really is an exercise in politics. It gives us a viable, interactive alternative to how we live today. Furusado provides a place to start when it comes to politics that are rooted in a sense of community. The word itself only became about community because of politics. The shift in definition from literal hometown to general nostalgia for village life and community occurred during the decades following the Meiji Restoration in 1868. In short, the Restoration put the Emperor back in power and began to make Japan much more Western. The feudal government was replaced with one modeled after European countries, and a capitalist economy began to be forced on the nation, replacing the feudal one. While the outside world had spent centuries moving to the city and forgetting village life, Japan did it in just a few short decades. By the 1920s, around 50% of workers were living in cities, whereas just a generation prior, 90% of the population was still living in villages. And as urban centers expanded, villages shrank or disappeared altogether. By the time World War II was over, there was an overwhelming sense that post-war Japan could no longer go home thanks to the rapid urbanization that gutted village life. The once literal term of Furusado became imbued with a much deeper meaning as a result of this cultural memory that lived on. While Furusado itself is generally seen as a kind of apolitical cultural phenomenon, as its meaning began to change after the Meiji Restoration, so did the politics within Japan. The new capitalist economy massively reshaped society. Workers were forced into wage labor, made to toil in factories under miserable conditions. Families were thrown into debt, and land they had lived on for generations became the property of landlords. Forced to sell their crops to pay rent, only to later have to buy back their own food, villages rapidly became poor. In response to these new oppressions, the Japanese left formed, and in particular, Japan's anarchist movement would take an intense interest in the village. Katobu Shusui, who was a social democrat at the time, traveled to the United States in 1905, where he was introduced to the works of Russian anarchists Mikhail Bakunin and Peter Kropotkin. After returning to Japan, Kotoku translated Kropotkin's book The Conquest of Bread into Japanese, releasing it in 1909. The translation quickly gained popularity with the new Japanese anarchist movement that Kotoku was now leading. While it covers a variety of things, one of the key points that The Conquest of Bread presents is a vision of decentralized communes where people work together for everyone's benefit. For Kotoku and his comrades, this wasn't just an idea. It was a reality they could see out their window. They pointed to the farming and fishing villages and how people who lived in them, the majority of the Japanese population at the time, had to work together to maintain their way of life. It was easy to build their new politics around these ideas. As an example of its influence, just a year after releasing the translation, fellow anarchist Akabe Hajime would write a pamphlet called The Peasant's Gospel, calling for the Japanese people to return to the village community of long ago, which our remote ancestors enjoyed. We must construct a free paradise of anarchist communism, which will flesh out the bones of the village community with the most advanced scientific understanding and with the lofty morality of mutual aid. This interest in the village would stay consistent throughout the following generations. Ito Noe, a feminist author and prominent figure in the second generation of Japanese anarchists, wrote an article called The Facts of Anarchy about her native village. We have often heard the abuse that the ideal of anarchist communism is an unrealizable fancy. 
Yet I have found that it is not a dream, but something aspects of which have been realized in the autonomy of the villages inherited from our ancestors. Now I want to depict the facts that I have seen personally at my native village. There are no chains of command or officials. The spirit of the associations inherited from their ancestors is to assist each other in times of trouble. Egoistic urban life is intolerable to those accustomed to village life. Where there is no hope of success besides poverty, it is far more comfortable and warm to support each other under the protections of the association. Although it might not seem relevant, there is actually a lot of overlap with Furisado. Furry signifies the patina of familiarity and naturalness that objects and human relationships acquire with age, use, and interaction. Sato also refers to self-governed autonomous areas and by extension to local autonomy. So Furisado is tied to autonomy and community, to human interaction on the local level. But previous generations of Japanese anarchists were importing European models, while the third generation sought to find out what anarchism meant to Japan and what Japan could mean to anarchism. Hata Shuzo was now the leading theoretician in the third generation, working on the idea of pure anarchism. He was inspired by the European texts, but wanted to build on their ideas to make them distinctly Japanese. This is the first time the Japanese anarchists sat down and really committed themselves to developing theory of their own and an understanding of what Japanese anarchism is. And to the pure anarchists, this meant looking to the village, where they saw healthy, natural anarchism happening. This is one of their contributions to anarchist theory, the idea that society is like a living being and capitalism is a kind of sickness afflicting it. It eats away at the sense of community and solidarity that all humans need and enjoy. And they saw restoring the healthy anarchism of the village as a necessity, but not by going backwards. Instead, they looked to dissolve the city back into the village. They recognized that the conveniences of modern life are still valuable, and by distributing the technology, trades, and skills back into the village, they could both end the destruction being caused by urbanization and transform the village into something better, the commune. Like Akabe's pamphlet, they sought to combine advanced science and technology with the morality of village life. And honestly, this isn't that far off from what we saw with City Folk and New Leaf. After the poor reviews for City Folk to restore the sense of community essential to Furisato and the series, in New Leaf, the city features were brought back into the town, reintegrated as the main street that comes to life as the player builds and expands the town community. And while the main street does make the town less rural, it represents one of the ways in which Furisato is defined. Furisato is not limited to an actual rural place, nor does it presuppose an agricultural lifestyle. It is rather everything the suburbs and metropoles are not. Compassion, camaraderie, tradition, and even motherly love are presumed absent from a post-war urbanized society. Unfortunately, even though the anarchists recognized that the Japanese nation state was preparing for a second world war as early as 1927, they couldn't halt its march towards fascism. And as it began to invade and colonize China and Korea in the early 1930s, there was intense suppression of the left that effectively ended the anarchist movement. But their ideas would live on, both inside and outside Japan. The 1970s and 80s saw Furusato revived, not just by the Japanese government, as we discussed earlier, but by environmentalist groups in Japan who saw local autonomy as a way to fight back against pollution and urbanization. At the same time, anarchism found new life in the green anarchists or eco-anarchist movement, with American philosopher Murray Bookchin as a notable pioneer. Like the Japanese anarchists in the first half of the century, Bookchin would look to decentralize communes as a way to rebuild a healthy society and halt the cancerous spread of urbanization. Bookchin would write extensively on the ways that capitalism and the industrialization and urbanization which it creates negatively affects society and humanity as a whole. By exploring the historic European village and American town as places where anarchism had organic roots, his writings echoed the pure anarchists in their analysis of how community could be found again and restored, should we choose to. And while Furusato and the theory of the Japanese anarchists ran parallel, through Bookchin's work, this gap is bridged. Capitalism, in its characteristically modern and dominant form, threatens not only to undermine every natural economy, be it small-scale agriculture, artisanship, simple exchange relationships, and the like, it threatens to undermine every dimension of organic society, be it the kinship tie, communitarian forms of association, systems of self-governance, and local allegiances. 
the sense of home and place. This exploration of politics gives us a different way of looking at why Animal Crossing is so popular. On a global scale, the series resonates with people, not just because it's cute, but because it gives us something that we're missing from our lives. I know it may seem easy to dismiss these ideas, but they keep coming back. Anarchism finding life in three generations of Japanese radicals, Furusato being revived after the war, and anarchism having global appeal to this day. Capitalism never went away, so Furusato and anarchism didn't either. Animal Crossing brings community and the politics that go with it to us today in a completely new format. There is this misconception that art happens in a vacuum, that everything is created in an apolitical void, but there's no way an artist isn't thinking about the world around them as they create. In the case of Iguchi, he's moved to work for Nintendo. He's lonely and he misses home. He's living in a country going through an economic downturn while constantly being bombarded with advertising, reminding him of village communities that no longer exist. It's not just for Asado, but capitalism that would have been on Aguchi's mind while developing Dubotsu no Mori. But unlike for Asado, capitalism is not present in the series. He makes a game without poverty, inequality, where you're never short on rent and your basic needs will always be met. He makes a game about a village, about community, where you have friends and a place to be yourself, where you're free. He makes a game where he can go home again. Animal Crossing isn't escapism or the only way millennials will ever own a house. It allows us to experience a different way of living. It shows us utopia. Even today, a century after the Japanese anarchists, these ideas keep surfacing in our stories, films, and video games. And in spite of capitalism cementing itself further into our lives, we keep dreaming this dream and finding new ways to talk about it. Ideas on how to make it reality. The quiet revolution of New Horizons is that it asks us to consider what we are building while reminding us that we're capable of being good to each other. It shows us that there's more to the world than ourselves than we've been told. It lets us build a home to go home to. Oh dear, there I go, prattling on about anarcho-communism again. I guess that doesn't qualify as news, does it? Oh well, have a great day out there.